Welcome to Section 420, Talking Yankees. Well, as we round out the preview of the other teams in the AL East, how can we go without mentioning the Yankees' arch rival, the Boston Red Sox? Now, to here to help us out will be Terry Cushman Jr. He's the founder and co-host of the Bastards of Boston Baseball podcast, and he's here to chat with us now. Hi, right, Terry. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Now, uh, you know, Yankees, Red Sox, you know, it could get violent, so but we'll, we'll, we'll try to be you know, very peaceful <laughs> here. We'll try to be peaceful. But uh, no, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, obviously, you're the founder and co-host of the Boston's of uh, the Basses of Boston Baseball uh, podcast available on Apple Podcasts. And again, uh, people can follow you on Twitter. It's a uh, Cushman MLB. And of course, follow the podcast as well on Twitter. Again, a Bastards underscore Boston. So again, pleasure to have you on the show. I looking forward to it. I love talking baseball. Now, um, your podcast, um, you know, it has some success. I heard, I heard it. Or I listened to one of your previous episodes. You're one of the top uh, 100 downloads for MLB podcasts. Is that correct? Typically, we do fall in the, you know, the bottom part of the uh, top 100. Correct. And I, I think we're going to make some big strides this season uh, as well. Typically, there's two other Red Sox podcasts within the market ahead of me, and I think we can leapfrog number two. Number one, unfortunately, is backed by Barstool Sports, so I don't know if I can ever overcome that, but um, but I'm going to try, and I'm going to be a pain in their butt. <laughs> no, I, I wish you the best look. I, I think I might even uh, try to reach out to one of those guys once, and it didn't get back. I think they're like section 138, and I'm like section 420, so I think we had like a, a section fight, but uh, I guess I got back, so whatever. <laughs> Um, so now the Red Sox, you know, this offseason didn't really make any like huge strides, any you know, big splash. And then they're kind of like, I don't know, what would, you, what would you say is like the state of the team right now? Just the whole organization. Like they're not, they don't seem like they're really going for it. You know, you know, they're not really making any big moves or going after big, big name players. But what do you what is their sort of plan? Well, it's very open to interpretation and there's different levels of pessimism and optimism as you you know, if you look at Red Sox Twitter, I, I tend to be a little bit more on the pessimistic side. I think if the stars align, we could be an 88 to 90 win team, which should probably get us into a wild card if the stars do align. But we've got a relatively new executive and high bloom comes from the Tampa organization. And he's made a lot of cute signings. Garrett Richards has elite metrics, you know, with a spin rate and all kinds of other things that could make him one of the top pitchers in the league. Kike Hernandez can play seven positions. Marwin Gonzalez can play seven positions. So he's built a very interesting dynamic team, but it's nothing like any of the four teams that won championships. And I think the fan base knows that. And so there's a lot of skepticism about the 2021 Boston Red Sox. Yeah, because it always seemed like the pattern with the Red Sox lately has been like you win a championship and then the next year kind of struggle, but it's like always just maybe one or two players away and then like you're right back in the championship hunt right away. This seems like this team might be like two to three seasons away really before you can say, hey, this this team got a shot at the World Series. That's probably accurate. I was looking at next year's free agency market and it's not insanely deep uh, with high-end pitching, you're going to have some older guys like Verlander, Scherzer, Grinky hit the market that will probably sign some short-term deals. Uh, Noah Syndergaard will probably be the top free agent uh, at 29 years old. So I don't know if we're really going to make a splash there, but the J.D. Martinez money comes off the books after next year. The David Price money, which we're paying half of his contract going forward, that comes off the books. Pedroia comes off this year. The Red Sox have no long-term money left outside of maybe Chris Sale, who we're not too worried about at this point because he's going to have a rebuilt elbow. Um, so it's going to be exciting in the next few years to see what Bloom does for sure. But I would say it would be extremely optimistic uh, uh, to, to win a championship before three years, I would say. Yeah, and you just mentioned sale before. Now they put him on the sixty day starting in um, February. But is there any progress yet? Has he started throwing, or is there any sort of timetable for him? 
I think he's throwing on flat ground right now and then doing general workouts with the rest of the team. So it seems to me early July would probably be the earliest and, and maybe perhaps later July, early August. He's about a month behind uh, Luis Severino uh, for comparison. So um, he's a gamer. I, I do, I do worry a little bit because he's got that herky jerky delivery. That's probably not good <laughs> for, for elbows. I mean, everybody knew he would get Tommy John at some point, you know, with a, with a really violent delivery like that. But um, but by all accounts, he is on track and has had no setbacks with his arm. Yeah. Cause when, I mean, when he's on, just, you know, his opposing team, I was like, we just got no shot in this game, you know, cause he's, when he's on, he's just untouchable. And yeah, like you said, he has that funky motion. That's what pretty much, especially against lefties, you just don't have a shot against him. Yeah. And Tanner Houck right now, one of our top prospects is fighting to try to make it onto the big club. He's got a very similar delivery as well. So, yeah, so hopefully he's fairly young. So hopefully we won't, we won't run into trouble too early with him, but, but yeah, we're to have two guys in that rotation though is, uh, you know, I'm pretty excited about it. And if you want to go the rest of rotation, obviously you go with pencil and Eduardo Rodriguez, uh, but you know the three, four, five starters now. Is like, you know a couple of arms in the mix. They got Nick Bavetta there, Nathan Avaldi. Uh, but you know just right now, you know assuming Sale comes back, who who you, you figure would, would be the five starters? You know, pretty much for the majority of the season. I think you'll go Eduardo Rodriguez, Nathan Avaldi, Martin Perez, Nick Pavetta, Garrett Richards, and the order is probably different, but it will be those five to start the season. I would love it if they put Avaldi in the bullpen as somewhat of a long guy, and then that that kind of paves the way for Tanner Houck to join the team right away. And Avaldi hit a hundred plus miles an hour on the gun ten times on Sunday. But the, he kind of fell apart as the uh, the order went through the second time, oh, well, coming up on the third time through the order. And he attacks the zone if you look at his, if you look at the chart. And I think guys start to sit on him after the first time through. So I would love it if, if a guy like Evoldi went to the pen. But uh, to start the season, unfortunately, he will be in the rotation. Yeah, I'm actually on the same page with you because I remember when the Yankees had Evaldi, like, I mean, by one of the hardest throwers in the game. But as a starter, it just seemed like he, when they try to make him a starter, he would just always get hurt. And I think he best serves the team the way he was back, I guess, the last championship of 2018, where, you know, he could close a game, he could do a little long relief, maybe spot start once in a while. Uh, I just think, yeah, I think we should put the, if you put that much workload on as a consistent starter, I think that's when he gets hurt. But I think, best value for Boston would be, I, I would, I totally agree with you. Bit of a middle relief guy, this case, you know, someone that has a bad day, he comes in, stops the bleeding, maybe just blow someone away in the eighth inning. If you need to get some strikeouts. I mean, I think for me, I think that would be a Valdi strength. Absolutely. And he's never going to pitch more than 120 innings. I would be shocked if you get that out of him in a season. And we debate this on our podcast all the time. And one of the things some of my co-hosts get hung up on is, well, he's making 17 million a year. You can't put him in the bullpen. And I always fire back with, is he really a $17 million a year guy anyway? Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, he's probably a seven or $8 million a year guy at best. And I I think you, you just have to do what's best for the team and make the pieces fit where, where they will ideally fit. And I, I don't, I don't think Cavaldi is a fit in the rotation. I totally agree. Now, as speaking of actually pitches, uh, at least relief pitches, make a lot of money. Surprisingly, Yankees and Boston do a little business. The Yankees send <laughs> Adam Adovito up north to Boston. Again, Adovito make a lot of money, but were you surprised by that? Yeah, I was shocked. I it, it hit you in waves. It was like, what? <laughs> the the Yankees and the Red Sox made a deal? Like, who is it? Some minor league pitcher that's like useless? And they're like, no, it's Adam Adovino. And you're like, what? Adam Adovino? And uh, yeah, I mean, he's a high-end pitcher. He hasn't really been a closer or necessarily a setup man, but he 
typically is solid from, from start to finish. I know last season his ERA was a little inflated, but he gave up, he gave up 12 runs in the entire two month season. Six of them were in one game to Toronto. Three of them were uh, against the Rays. So if those starts are more average, his numbers aren't so bad. So the one thing that does concern me and has concerned me about him is he's very prone to having bases get stolen on him because of his slow delivery to the plate. So that's something that will hopefully be managed, but it's a one year deal and I never would have guessed. And I mean, just to throw in something, I'm surprised. I'm not a Gary Sanchez guy. I don't know where you guys are with him. I think it would have been extremely easy to just non-tender him, not spend the six million, and then you just keep Ottavino. I, and Ottavino's making a little bit more than that, but but I just feel like you guys have Higashioka. It's not too hard to find a, a solid backup guy. I mean, I loved Sandy Leone when he was with the Red Sox, and I'm a big Kevin Pulecki guy, so it's it's not too hard to go find a guy like that to you know, to, to be your backup. So I was a little surprised that, that we ended up with him for sure. Now, um, you know, another uh, uh, pitcher in Boston and the Red Sox, and the Yankees were kind of kicking the ties, this guy too, uh, Sarah Mora. Are they looking, the Red Sox looking for him to maybe compete for a starting spot or is he kind of just destined for the bullpen? Oh, he's definitely going to be a reliever going forward. Yeah. We have had quite, a run of success with uh, Japanese uh, pitchers, uh, Koji Uihara, most notably. Junichi Tozawa was um, a solid uh, late inning guy in our pen. We had Hideki Okajima. So I think they're just kind of looking at Sawamura to just kind of just be one of those solid situational guys. I, I don't know if they'll necessarily have a defined role. We don't even know who our closer would be. If you asked me and two of my co-hosts who you think the closer should be for the Red Sox, you'd probably get three different answers. Mm. <laughs> I kind of lean towards Ottavino myself at the moment, but I, the hope universally amongst Red Sox fans is that it'll be um, Darwin's in Hernandez who throws gas. He just has issues with his walk rate, but, but a guy like Salamora, he's a bit of a mystery right now. And, and who knows anybody can win that job by, by early summer. Yeah. I think Ottavino will be good. Like he'll probably like he was good for the Yankees for the most part. He's like a good seventh inning guy. I don't know if he's a closer type, but he's definitely, but I think he'll be good with boss. I think he'll bounce back. So um, yeah, again, he's making a lot of money, but I think he'll have a good season for you. So a uh, couple of familiar faces that uh, yeah, maybe Yankee fans are used to uh, won't be here for 2021. Uh, Andrew Benetini uh, gets uh, traded to KC. And of course, Jackie Bradley Jr. Who, uh, again, a very good defender and speedy on bases. He's going to be with Milwaukee. So again, a little different look, um, you know, this season. Yeah, it's really puzzling how Andrew Benatendi had such a dramatic downfall. And last I knew he was like two for 16 in Royals camp. So not even off to a hot start with them, but that's a very low pressure market. And if he can revive his career, that's definitely a, a place he could do it. I, I was a big Ben Attendee guy. And when he first started, he had some pop. His OBP was always in the high threes. He would get on base and looked like a, a future five, two player, but unfortunately just the Red Sox decided we better move him now while we can get something. And, and that was the, uh, the, the decision that they made and with Jackie Bradley I was never a Bradley guy his slumps were so painful he was fun to watch in the outfield but you knew with Scott Boris as his agent and the fact that the Red Sox had a little bit of flexibility but not a ton it was just going to be all but impossible to bring him back for the contract he wanted so the Brewers ended up with him I'm a little surprised that was the destination he kind of takes over for Ryan Braun on that club and I hope he does well. I, I've got no ill will towards Jackie Bradley. And I think the Brewers is a fun team. And um, I'm sure he'll, he'll enjoy his two years there. Now, one of the players you mentioned when your podcast that, you know, for Boston to have a, maybe a shot to get 80 to 90 wins a season 
will be um, Alex Verdugo in, in center field. Uh, can you just tell us a little about him? Yeah, Verdugo was kind of, I don't know if you want to call him the centerpiece of, of the Mookie trade because we got two borderline elite prospects in that deal, but but Verdugo was the major league ready player we got and immediately took Mookie's place in, in right field. And I think he hit like 333 or something, didn't show a ton of pop, but it seemed like it, it was coming. He established himself as a very viable leadoff guy. And the one thing Mookie never really did was he never really endeared himself from a personality standpoint to the Red Sox. He was a flashy player. He was fun to watch. He was the backbone of that 2018 team, but he wasn't much of a personality and you're seeing it. You're seeing it with Alex uh, Verdugo and the fan base has really taken to him. And I think he's going to be a very, a very popular player. He could be kind of like a, almost a prime Shane Victorino type guy for the Red Sox. who was universally loved everywhere he played, including in Boston for the, for the two years he was with us. So um, his Jersey is going to be a popular one. Let's put it that way. Lots of, lots of sales on his Jersey. Gotcha. And another young player that, you know, looks like he's having a good spring Bobby Dahlbeck at first base. I'm a pessimist on Dahlbeck. Uh, the power is mesmerizing. He's got light tower power. I'll even compare it a little bit to, to Aaron judge's power. He can just mash the, the crap out of that baseball, but the strikeouts are insane. He had in 20 at bats. I think this was leading into yesterday. He had 11 strikeouts. That's been a huge problem all the way up through the minors. So I'm not really convinced yet that he's a bona fide major leaguer. He is slated to make the team. I did raise the question on the most recent episode that perhaps he won't make the team because there are a couple of other guys, Jonathan Arauz, uh, Christian Arroyo, specifically that are playing very well right now and could easily win a spot uh, on the big club. Arroyo will for sure, actually, but our is not necessarily. Uh, so the Red Sox will have options there as far as what to do with Dahlbeck and what to do with first base, but there's a lot of potential. He's probably got the most pop Bobby Dahlbeck of uh, any player on the roster. So We'll just have to see how it develops. Okay. And of course, um, you know, managing the team, Alex Cora now, obviously last season, got the whole thing had to step away because, you know, he was involved with the whole Houston thing. But um, are you surprised that the ownership brought him back? I'm not surprised. Uh, I didn't think it would happen, but he was the elephant in the room the whole way through the off season until he finally did get hired. I think Sam fold ended up being the runner up and he's got a front office role with uh, the Phillies right now and has a, has a history with Heim bloom, but, but core is back and he's a smart baseball guy. He's going to have that cloud over him from the, the 2017 scandal, regardless of how successful he is the rest of his career. Um, I kind of would have preferred to, to go a different way, but he, here's the interesting thing. And nobody's talking about this right now and, and nobody needs to talk about it right now, but I'm always a forward thinker. If this season doesn't go well and it's supposed to go well because we're right up to the luxury tax. So they spent money. So the expectations for the front office seem to be to, to try to make the postseason. but if it doesn't go well and they finish a little under 500, and then say next summer, say we're three or four games under 500 and next season's not going well, the fan base isn't going to be blaming Alex Cora. They're going to be blaming Hein Bloom. And I think it was a huge misstep on the part of Bloom to bring in a guy who's going to be way more popular than he is. Typically, managers will, uh, excuse me, typically general managers will get to fire one manager throughout the course of his career. And, and that manager will probably take the bullets for a little while before the GM seat gets hot. Heim Bloom isn't going to have that luxury. <laughs> so it was a very interesting move, but uh, we'll, we'll see how it comes out. I, I guess if they win, it, it doesn't matter. So 
Yeah, especially the fact that, you know, Cora, at least he, you know, gave got Boston a championship. So, again, you know, the fans are going to obviously gravitate to him more than GM, who, again, frankly, hasn't done that much, you know, really overall in terms of any big moves or trades at least have panned out at this moment to be like, wow, what a deal. Yeah, and, I mean, trading Mookie was extremely unpopular. I get it. I'm not a fan of having massive contracts for position players. Like, for instance, I probably wouldn't give Aaron Judge a massive deal, especially given the fact that he's injury prone. But I would assign that Garrett Cole contract all day long, any day. I'll pay for pitching. No no problems. But I would much rather kind of develop and, and do, you know, develop a lead talent and then bring in some – mid-level guys um, that, you know, could still play a, a, a strong role in, in a championship. But so Bloom, you know, trades Mookie, that's unpopular. The Ben Attendee trade, not very popular. Your casual fans are probably upset about how 2020 went. You know, the hardcore fans understood the process and that we needed to kind of clean house a little bit, but he's not a very popular gm right now so so we'll, we'll we'll see how it develops yeah i mean obviously certain cities like new york philadelphia boston where one i think one season are okay but two or three losing seasons are not going to tolerate it at all and then you know and i know the boston fans up there just as you know crazy as the yankee fans like if you get no playoffs for a year it's like all right we'll let you slide one year but that next year and if you don't get two years in a row you know someone's head's got to get chopped off yeah i i refer to to this century so far, 20 years of it so far as the world series era for Boston. And we've never missed the playoffs three years in a row. We've missed it two in a row now. So, so hopefully this isn't the first, <laughs> hopefully those stars align. Like I was saying in, in the open of the show. So it's sort of, I mean, you kind of, you know, hinted what you feel anyway, but again, so let's say we're sitting here, you know, end of the season where do you think Boston is in terms of their record and kind of standings nail East? I've picked them to win 78 games. So that puts them a few games under 500. The American league East is interesting right now. I, I think most people are going to pick the Yankees by default because there's still, it's a very well-balanced team. You're going to have enough offense. You're probably going to have enough starting pitching and even without Britain, I, I think your bullpen's going to be okay. A, a lot of serviceable guys in there. So at the moment, I, I kind of picked the Yankees to win the division. And then how good Tampa is, they brought back Archer. They brought in Michael Waka. So they have a great pitching program. So if they can get those two guys turned around, I think they're going to be a thorn in everyone's side, possibly upper 80s wins. The Toronto Blue Jays are interesting. They might have the best offense in the league right now, especially with the Springer pickup. And you have the Bichette, Biggio, Vladimir Jr., who looks amazing, by the way. I didn't even recognize him, how ripped that guy is, uh, Vlad, Vladdy Jr. But they've they've got a very good offense, but the their rotation is, is a little suspect. And... Um, their their bullpen but who knows they did go to the alcs two years in a row i don't think anybody saw that coming um you know fairly recently so it's just like i said an interesting division the, the only thing you can count on right now is that baltimore will definitely be bad <laughs> yeah i gave so, them 30 wins maybe but uh yeah it's gonna be a rough season there all right yeah. so uh you know that's season so you know obviously yankees boston a lot of history a lot of rivalry so we'll have a little fun so i'm gonna ask you a couple questions sure most hated return Red Sox play in a Yankee uniform, Roger Clemens or Johnny Damon? Oof. Um, the Damon one stings the most, in, in my opinion. He was, he was a postseason hero here. He was well-loved. And I, I mean, he, he, unlike Clemens, Clemens, Damon went, immediately from our roster to yours. And I think the expectation amongst Red Sox fans, including the Red Sox media, quite frankly, was that somehow, some way, Damon would still be on the uh, 2006 staff. But, but it didn't happen, and he shaved his beard and, and played in the Bronx and, and won a championship with you guys. All right, yeah. And um, I, I think with Damon, like, you know, 
um, you, you know, like I guess you know, he, he really gra- he it was became like the team mascot in a way, as the whole beat and all. So yeah, for him to make that jump, like I would definitely figure that you know he would be the more of the seen as the more of a turncoat. Um, yeah. So another one here. So now let's go back to some, you know, there's been some great uh, games, moments, series between uh, both teams. So I'm going I'm to offer you a trade. Would you give up the Kurt Schilling bloody sock game to erase the Bucky Dent home run? <laughs> oh, that's a tough one. Selfishly, I think I would, I would probably keep the, uh, the Schilling game, but what makes it a tough decision is three out of my four grandparents were big Red Sox fans and they just missed. They, they passed away. One passed away in 2001, the other one in 2002, the other one in, uh, in 1990. So if I give back the, the Bucky Dent game, they see a championship, but but I just think the the bloody sock game, especially, is just so iconic and kind of kind of will be a big part of of the story and the history of, of this franchise for this century. All right, and now the last one, and this will just be Red Sox centric. Obviously, who's the bigger Red Sox, Ted Williams or David Ortiz? Another, another tough one. That's a really tough one. David Ortiz does, will never have the, the stats that, that Ted William had, including the 400 season, but I still have to go with Ortiz because he's one of the best postseason players in MLB history. He hit 688 in the, in the 2013 world series. 688 and that number came down it was in the 800s and the 700s and finally dipped below seven as they got to game six but um you got to go with ortiz the that iconic grand slam in the alcs against the tigers when tory hunter went over the wall to try to get it um it's an extremely tough pick because the Red Sox, we were the lovable losers, and they kind of had this romantic history, and, and you don't have that without Ted Williams. But gun to my head, David Ortiz. Gotcha. All right, interesting. Yeah, that's a tough one there. So, Terry, uh, you know, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, you know, a lot of insights, some some Boston players that maybe, you know, not too many uh, baseball fans are familiar with. Um, it's going to be hard for me to w- wish you luck, even though, you know, <laughs> But uh, no, I hope you guys are good. I hope everyone stays healthy. No, you know, I'll at least wish you no, no, no injury on anybody. So we'll, we'll leave it. I, I wish you no injuries. There you go. <laughs> okay. So it's I the, appreciate that. Yeah. It's the, so the, the podcast can check it out. The Bastards of Boston Baseball on Apple Podcast. Check it out anyway. You know, even if, you don't, if, you, if you're a Yankee fan that doesn't like the Red Sox, check it out anyway. It's a, it's a good group, good, good bunch of guys. And uh, thank you once again for coming on the show.